Well, the farther I go upriver, the deeper these holes seem to be getting. It's gotta be a bear. I'm thinking. Gotta be a bear. There's no prints in the sand. Lots of digging. See, it's something digging here, digging here. Since the last flood, the elk trails coming down the bank here. Look at this. That's for milk. Maybe we should walk up there. Let's get it down there, you know, maybe.
All right, here we go again. I actually have the, um, I'm loading the first half of the video I did with the ladies. And I couldn't, for whatever reason, the Sony Handycam screwed up again. Probably gonna have to add it on the shelf. The other six broken Sony, all the video cameras I've got. It just will not load the two, almost three hour clip onto YouTube privately so I could download it again. Maybe try that route. It won't load onto my laptop. It won't, won't load onto the other laptop. Luckily, I ran the GoPro the whole time. So I managed to make a video for the first half of our sit down. And I will be loading that on the membership view only for a, period, for a period of time. Don't get all upset. There's still free content coming every single day. All right. And the motivation of this is to use the monies for good. There is a shit pile of hungry children for real in my community. And I'm going to feed them. All right. So um, if that upsets you, <laughs> it's on you. But that's what I am doing here with this part one and part two. Will eventually be public? Eventually. Sometime. I don't know when. Whatever. But right now, um, my mission is to do good. And that's what I'm going to do. And this is what I can do. All right. Now, there you go. Um... Drizzling rain today. I set I reset the setting on this thing to cinematic. The settings I'm putting this GoPro to are very high quality. Put them on the laptop. I mean, it is high quality. Why are they loading to YouTube? Not as clear. I don't know why. I googled it. You Google it too, and find out why. But it says it's standard. Loads it in 360 or 30, whatever the hell it is. P, and then as the time goes on, apparently. It becomes more clearer as YouTube does its thing on their end. So I haven't a clue what's going on for all the numerous people that have been complaining. I don't know. I don't know what's up. Seriously. I don't get it. But I uh, I tried another setting on this GoPro. We'll see if that makes a difference. I don't know. And there's no option when you're loading onto YouTube either. There you go. That's all I got. Now, listen to this. Let's get some more voices heard on this drizzly Saturday. Hi Steve, sorry no names. I have recently discovered something interesting that I think I should share. It involves these creatures and their stealth. The reason I've only just discovered it after 50 odd years is because the level of stealth that they exhibit has been at such a level I have ignored or denied the signs. I think these creatures are very adaptive animals slash people and as they become more and more exposed due to our encroachment into nature, they have to become more and more careful around us. It's not so much the males as the females that let me explain exactly what I've seen and experienced. I've always been a keen fisherman, and especially trout fishing, because that way I can provide some food for myself. Infrequently, I encountered something that I couldn't explain at, that, at the time, but now I can. Sometimes I saw them, but most of the time I didn't see them, but I could tell they were there. And in some strange way, they managed to communicate the fact that I was, that I was in the way. Quite often I would feel like a sudden need to go home or remove myself from the riverbank. Remembering those instances, I was able to combine those strange feelings with actual sightings. And over many, many years, I've managed to arrive at the conclusion that they were using the river constantly to come and go to an area that you might describe as a nursery. A few times I was fishing near a shallow section of the river and I would see something that looks like a piece of the riverbank that fell off into the water and would slowly make progress downstream over the shallow areas. One of these shallow areas was a mere, was sorry, was a weir made many years previously by textile manufacturers. The mills were all gone, but you could still see remnants of those buildings. Most of the times they were making progress downstream. On one occasion that I can remember, it was making progress upstream. And I realized now that I was fishing at a pinch point and the only place could go was in the river to get past me. Again, it looked like a large sod of earth with grass. And as I looked closely, more like a fleece. 
few things that gave this floating debris away. The first was the fact that it was making progress upstream where the river flow was quite constant. This fact drew my attention and I watched it very closely. The second was the movement of the fleece. There was a slow undulation within the fleece that reminded me of somebody or something crawling. And then the front six inches of this fleece rotated slowly through 90 degrees in my direction as it was at its closest point, 15 yards. That was when I realized that was probably its head. And it was turning its head to look directly at me, which it did twice as it passed at a snail's pace. No eyes were visible. I often get confused with my own reactions to these things when I have a close encounter. Sometimes I think I haven't understood what it is I'm looking at. And then there's a part of me that knows exactly what I'm looking at. And this makes me realize that over the years, and there were many years of contact with these beings, I have somehow developed a kind of a split personality. One side of me knows and the other denies or pretends not to know. Hence taking over 50 years to make sense of it all. If anyone knows what I'm referring to, it would be nice to hear from you via Steve. Just know that I'm not alone in this. There have been previous to this encounter some very close encounters that I could not process or come to terms with and caused a lot of trauma. It would be unfair to blame these creatures for the trauma they create in us, I think. It's just that they are scary. I followed the subject long enough to be, to be disturbed by the lurid fascination we have with these creatures. This is born in the lack of awareness. We should really be more sympathetic, as this is a creature that seems to have genetic similarities to the human species and may prove to be our savior. Quick message to trout fishermen. If you want an encounter with these creatures, just try fishing into the night, but don't expect to take any fish home. Thanks, Steve. Okay, man, gotcha. Shared. Let's see what comes of it in the comment section below, or maybe somebody will email in to me at sharemystoryathowtohunt.com. Sounds like you've had a whole pile of experiences, man. A whole pile. Keep the wheels turning, right? Oh. All right. This next email is titled, Ontario, Canada Experiences. I wonder if this is triggered from that request from somebody who just emailed earlier about asking if anybody else in Ontario had experiences with me. Well, there's been thousands. Hey, Steve, my name is Cody, and I'm from Northeastern Ontario, Canada. I'd like to share two experiences I had over the years that have left me with big question marks. Hopefully you or the other viewers might have some insight on what I'm about to say. The first experience happened around 2013 or 14 when I was 19 20 years old. I lived in a small town called Halebury, which is surrounded on one side with a big lake. The street I lived on went straight downhill towards the lake and was about a five minute walk away. I'd often jog from my place down to the lake and down the road along the lake for about five, for about five kilometers, then turn around and head back. This particular night, <clears throat> excuse me, it was around 10 p.m. When I left, as it was summertime and the sun had already set, my headphone earbud batteries died on the way there. So on the way back, the only sound I could hear was my breath and footsteps as I made my way through the darkness along the side of the road, which had a small bicycle path I used to jog on. It was a quiet night with noticeably few cars going by. I was surprised as I, was, as I would usually use the light of the passing vehicles to help keep track of my footing when the moon wasn't out, so this jog was particularly dark. I was about a kilometer away from my place and just getting back into the housing portion of the town. When over the lake, I noticed a bright blue light slash orb, maybe 10 to 20 feet above the water. It was about 100 yards from me, which would have made it about 50 yards off the shore. At first, I thought it may have been a light from a boat, but no motor sounds or anything or any other lighting. Then I thought maybe it's from a cottage across the lake. However, it seemed to be way too close to my side, since the other side of the lake was a kilometer or more away. 
And just was as I was thinking to myself, what the heck is that light? It sped off at an incredible speed down the lake ahead of me. The orb then blinked three times like a set of flashes and proceeded to speed back my way and passed me. It was going so fast I could barely keep up with it with my eyes, and by the time my body turned to follow it, it, as it passed me, it had already disappeared. And oh yeah, I forgot to mention, this orb of light didn't make a single sound as it sped up or when it came back my way. I stood there for a moment listening to the sounds around me, and there was not a noise to be heard, although it was quite windy. After a minute or so, with nothing happening, I continued my way home without other incidents. You know, this is where it gets weird. After I got home, I showered and prepared for bed. I got under the covers to watch a show before I fell asleep. My bedroom was located in the basement portion of the house. The light was on in the hallway. But I had turned my light off to keep... To, sorry, to help... Sorry, guys. <clears throat> but I had turned my light off to help me wind down. Well, a few minutes passed, and all of a sudden, I could feel this incredible weight slowly creeping up my body, but nothing was there. Starting from my feet moving up as the weight climbed my body, I felt like I was getting crushed. When it reached up to my chest and head, I couldn't breathe or lift my head anymore, but I was still able to keep my eyes open. I had a short, what the F moment, and then quickly just filled with rage. Now, I must say, I'm not one to believe in God or feel like there's a power that will help me when I'm in need. And that's just me. Obviously, no judgment on any beliefs out there, but I always thought that religion was just the government's way of gathering people to put information they want in their heads and get donations to keep the masses in lower social standings. Sorry, and keep and get donations to keep the masses in lower social standings. So they, the government... Can keep all the power. Anyways, that being said, I used the power of my own will, and in my mind I screamed, get off me right effing now. And just as it came on to me, it slowly moved back down my body as if, as it released my lungs and I gasped for breath. Just as it left the tip of my toes, I sat up in a hurry, and I saw a huge black shadow from the light in the hallway just outside my bedroom door, which was in the direction of the foot of my bed. Just like if someone left my room and walked down the hallway, you could see the shadow getting smaller as it made its way further from the door. The same time as the pressure was relieved from my body and I was able to sit up, I also heard a faint woman's voice in my head that said, Are you okay? In a worrisome tone, I didn't recognize the voice and I thought it was I was imagining it. I got up as fast as I could, still a bit out of breath. I ran to the door and looked down the hallway, but there was nothing there. I checked the rest of the basement and nothing. I took some deep breaths and sat at the corner of my bed to calm down, but needless to say, I didn't sleep that night in fear of whatever it was coming back. Nothing else happened the next year or so I lived there. I then moved to the city for a few years and almost forgot about it until I started watching your channel. Story number two. At this time, I had been a subscriber to the channel for the hunting stories, but it was just getting into the encounters and such, so there wasn't much knowledge shared yet on the mystical characteristics these beings have. But I definitely had an open mind, all things unknown. I won't be disclosing the location of this experience, as it's super close to my moose hunting grounds, and I don't want anyone near this sweet spot. This year, I saw 43 moose during the hunting season, 35 last year, and needless to say, I'm not looking for company in my spot, lol. However, for those of you in Ontario, this story takes place in the Wildlife Management Unit number 29. In mid-September 2019, I found a small camping spot about 12 kilometers down a gravel road. There was a small entrance, just big enough for a small car, but after 15 feet or so, it opened up to a big circular area, maybe 30 feet wide with a fire pit in the middle. Beyond that, there was a small trail leading to the lake. And this path was maybe 50 feet to the lake. So I decided to camp right by the water instead of in the big opening and set up my tent and got my fire going. 
I was planning on staying a couple weeks alone trying to fish and hunt grouse for my pro team. As I brought some dehydrated, dehydrated meals I prepped for carbs and veggies. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was armed with a 12 gauge pump shotgun with birdshot. And I kept a few slug shells in my pocket in case a close call with a black bear or wolves. As we have both of these animals quite dominantly in this area. The first week or so went totally fine. I caught a few walleye and even managed to get a few grouse. After tracking their wing beats in the bush, since the leaves don't ha since the leaves haven't fallen from the vegetation on the side of the roads yet, the grouse weren't coming to the road for sun as it normally did, and instead just stayed in the bush drumming their wings. <clears throat> Excuse me. As you keep walking the gravel road, about 30 yards past the trail I chose to camp down, there's a small marshy area on the same side of the road that's connected to the lake I was camped at. This swampy spot is important later in the story. And as the crow flies from my tent, it was about 50 yards or so from me as it bends around in my direction as the lake opens up. This is about the ninth or 10th night now, and nothing weird has happened. I was enjoying a fire right outside my tent, and as it was getting late, sorry, and it was getting late. All the sounds in nature were abundant. You could hear the squirrels squeaking and dropping small pine cones and such into the water off of a, off a tree limb. And the crickets and frogs were all making noise. It was probably midnight or so when the fire died out and I crawled into my tent. In my tent, I sleep on an inflatable sleeping pad that I had. Then I had a light wool blanket and then my sleeping bag on top of that. I was just getting settled and comfy turned my headlamp off and was enjoying the sounds as I was thinking about my day and planning for the next as I knew it was supposed to thunderstorm pretty heavily. Maybe five to minutes, five to ten minutes or so had passed when out of nowhere I hear this huge splunk in the water by the marshy swampy area I had mentioned. The splash wasn't anything I've ever heard before. It didn't sound like a rock or a beaver tail slap, even or even a large animal jumping into the water. You know when an Olympic diver hits the water and they're able to do a dive without making a splash of water come up? Well, this was the same, except it sounded like something much, much larger hitting the water, but no splashing after. Not a single sound of a drop of water hitting the surface of the lake after the initial splunk. I was racking my brain trying to figure out what could have made that sound. I had my screen tent window in that direction already half unzipped for a breeze. So after I heard it, I sat up, turned on my headlamp and looked out the screen window to try to see if I could catch a glimpse of whatever it was. But there's only a small trail leading to the swamp apart from where my tent was and I couldn't see all the way through the foliage that was around. So no luck on the visual. In that moment, to be cautious, I said in a normal speaking voice, Hey, I'm trying to sleep over here, just in case it was actually a bear or another animal. As I laid back down and cocooned myself up in my sleeping bag, I realized the woods had gone quite silent. No more crickets or frogs or squirrels. Just a slight breeze flapping parts of the tent around. Now, this is the messed up part. I've been going crazy trying to understand. As I was laying there, eyes still open and not too sleepy because of the splash I had heard a few minutes prior, all of a sudden I could feel an enormous hand lifting my head up. Now I'm six foot three, 200 pounds, and I can palm a basketball. And my hand on my head from palm to the top of my forehead, I could only reach the crown area of the top of my head as I rest my hand on it. Now, the hand I felt wasn't direct contact. It's hard to explain. The science behind this might not be right, as I was in high school when I learned this, and it's been over a decade, but from what I remember, our energy emitted from our body creates a microscoping layer of electrons on the outer layer of our body. So in reality, if you're looking under a microscope, there's a super thin layer of this energy separating you from what you're touching. Now, like I said, the science and terms might not be right because it's been forever, but I distinctly remember this info. Now, the hand I felt 
would have had to go through the ground, through the floor of the tent, through the sleeping pad. The wool blanket and the sleeping bag to reach my head, but I could feel it, not directly. But as I was describing, it was as though the energy around this hand was creating a space between us. But I could still feel the separation in the fingers and the size of the hand itself, and it was huge. My fingers could only reach the crown of my head, but I could feel the fingers of this hand at the base of my neck. So it was almost double the length of my hand. The whole time I felt a sense of calmness, like everything was okay, although I could still feel my heart going a thousand beats a second, there was a warm sensation coming from the hand as it lifted my head up off the sleeping bag a few inches, enough to where my neck was arced and I could look at my feet from this position. It held my head there for a few seconds before I said in my mind, just let me sleep. Then slowly, just as my head was lifted up, it was set back down on the sleeping bag and the feeling of the hand separating from my head felt as though it was, sorry, felt as though it was going straight down into the ground. Not like if it were to slide its hand under the tarp, then lift up, it went straight down. Then there was absolute silence, no footsteps, no breathing, no mind speak, still no woodland noises either. I would have to say the hand had contact with my head for maybe a minute or so in total. Then, just as if I blinked, I woke up in the morning and all was normal. I looked at the floor of the tent and all was fine. I quickly put the vent out of my mind as I could feel the moisture in the air for the storm that was coming and I wanted to try and get a grouse or some kind of food before I was caught in the rain. I walked about 10 kilometers or so total that morning and on the way back it really started to rain. Now this is another weird part. As I got to my tent, basically diving inside to escape the water, there was a pool of water coming up inside my tent from the floor exactly where my head would have been rest resting when the hand lifted it up. That was the only place that had accumulated water. I was basically frozen for a moment in shock, thinking what the heck could have done that? Thinking back to the events of the night before and looking at the water now in my tent, I couldn't figure out how it was possible. I mean, if there wasn't a hole or anything in the bottom of the tent. So, with my sleeping situation all wet and such, I ended my trip early and left that evening, so I didn't experience anything else. I used the same tent the following year, and it was as good as new. No issues in the rain or anything. So now I'm left wondering, can these beings amplify the same energy we have around their bodies to create a larger barrier around them? Maybe that's how they can disappear or amplify some of their abilities. Can they amplify the energy so much that that it that that is camouflages them? Can they amplify the energy so much that it camouflages them? And can they use that energy to move through solid objects? Like how the hell did it go through all that stuff to touch my head without damaging anything and having to go through the earth itself? Maybe the being opened a portal or source to reach through and touch me. All in all, I'm just left with more questions than answers, and I'm pretty sure I've seen every video that's been put out on this channel and haven't yet heard of an experience quite like mine. So, I figured I'd like to take the time to share to see if anyone else may have had something of this nature happen to them. I'm planning to head back to that spot next month when the weather warms a bit. Beginning of May right now, and we had a snowstorm last week uh-huh so we shall see if anything happens this time around also a quick ad a close friend of mine told me about an encounter where he saw a being from about 75 yards away knee deep in a swampy area of a lake on the other side of an island while he was fishing in a boat the island was probably 100 yards across where he lost sight of the being as he passed and when he and when he looped around the other side, the being was gone. He described the being to have brown, hairy legs, but was wearing a white and blue jacket and a brown, hairy head. He didn't have much else for description as he's driving the boat, but said the area was 
it was standing in was three to four feet deep and it only came up to this thing's knees. I'm not sure if my friend wants me to share, so I'll leave this story as it is. But some encounters were told where these beings had worn articles of clothing. So I figured it might help someone if I added it in. Thanks, Steve, for taking the time to read this. I know it's probably a pretty long one, but I figured I should put both experiences in one email, as you say, to get it all out at once. I didn't reread it, but the periods and commas should be pretty well all there. LOL. Thanks for everything you do. If you're ever in Ontario and want to meet up and swap stories along with some good food, I'll be there. I'm so thankful for all the people sharing experiences and helping me and others make sense of the very confusing real world. Love you all and stay safe out there, Cody. Okay, man. This is quite the experience. And like you know, I've heard, you've heard all the videos. The videos. You've heard all the people here so far. That's not a common one, right? But a lot of people are too insecure to share their details of their stories because they think it's too far out there and they don't want to be called crazy. So they keep it inside and think that they might be crazy, right? So... Let's see if anybody else has something similar they want to crack open and get out and get out to the public, to all of you via me, right? We'll see. And then your friend seeing something wearing a blue jacket. That's a different one, but not a new one. There has been a lot of people say that they saw some sort of form of clothing on these beings. We even had one, I think a scientist, I read in a book years back of a scientist who said flat out, in a conversation with another scientist, I believe, he said flat out, I wish I didn't see what I saw. I remember reading this. He said he wishes he didn't see what he saw, but he saw this thing vanish before his eyes. And he said it also had a blue-ish belt around its waist. Some kind of belt. I never forgot reading that because that was the first time I ever heard of anything like that. And at that time, I wasn't really up to date on the uh, <clears throat> the special abilities, we'll call it, that these beings possess. But I don't know why, I just never forgot reading that particular experience shared. So, and tell you what, imagine coming forward, that would have been over 10 years ago I read that. Imagine coming forward with that 10 years ago, even today. All right, that's what you saw. And the shitty, the shitty deal is, so many people see these crazy ass things during this lifetime and it's just so hard to come forward to be honest about it right and it really is unfair it's not fair it's not fair anyway let's get into it there's more people lined up waiting to be heard okay we got a follow-up email from a viewer who sent in a photograph of the two lights in the sky I am following up on your question regarding my last email to you that you read on February 8th, 2024. The picture was taken on an iPhone 12. I clean the lenses regularly and I know what light distortion is. The time was 6.30 p.m. The ambient temperature was approximately 50 degrees Fahrenheit. I was standing on flat ground and I was standing in the midst of the parking lot on asphalt pavement. I cannot think of any exterior conditions to affect the photos as I take multiple sunsets each week when I can catch one. I also take photos of the moon and star constellations on good clear nights. I'm going to include a photo I took prior to the photo of the lights and there are no and they are not appealing in the previous photo that was a split second prior. Oh, appealing. I think he meant they're not appearing in the previous photo that was a split second prior. I've not had this anomaly before, and I was curious because of your photographic experience. I personally have not used a camera with a lens in a decade. They're too cumbersome for the spur of the moment's occasions. Here are the two related photos. One is the same clear sky prior to the lights, and the second is right after. God bless and have a prosperous day. Right on. Appreciate you answering. There's the photo. You guys remember that photo previously? So there's the clear sky without the lights. And I was remember, I was just an innocent question. Was it from inside behind a pane of glass? And there is his original 
You see two lights in the distance. In the next photo, he zoomed in on the lights for everybody, for everyone to see easier. There they are. There's the lights in the sky. There you go. Appreciate it, man. I'm glad I got your uh, reply soon. Holy shit, what do we got here? Coincident? This is crazy. This is crazy. Coincidentally, this next email is titled Lights in the Sky. Steve's name is Jack. People call me Uncle Jack. I'm a free man and don't give two flying fucks what people think of me or my story. <laughs> I was there, and I experienced it at them. I've emailed you before about the belief I have in the subject of the forest people. I've never had an eyewitness encounter or face-to-face, -face, but I've had things happen that made me go, huh? But this one right here just stopped being my tracks. I was watching your episode titled, He Caught It on His Trail Camera Picks Included. Sorry. I was watching your episode episode titled, He Caught It on His Trail Camera, Picks Included, when someone emailed the story of lights in the sky they had witnessed and captured on their smartphone. Do you realize how random this is, you guys? <laughs> Can't make this shit up. I was in the kitchen listening to the story, and as I walked in the living room, my drill dropped because it's the same damn picture I have from nighttime from my experience. Someone, name withheld, emailed in a story of seeing two bright lights in the sky February 26, 2024 at 6.15 p.m. I think we got the date wrong there. <laughs> they took the pics from the Walmart parking lot of New Bern, North Carolina at around 6 p.m. It was very similar to my experience in June of 2023. My experience was in June of 2023 in the Pocono Mountains of Western PA. There are plenty of people in the parking lot, and there was even a young man collecting shopping carts from the parking lot to bring back to the shopping cart corral. He was a mere 15 feet away from me, but had his face buried in his phone. Typical. When I saw what I saw and reacted, I seemed to be the only person who had witnessed it. <clears throat> I've always been interested in the paranormal, i.e. UFO, Sasquatch, ghosts, anything interesting out of the ordinary. I never thought I would have an experience like this, especially as fast as it happened. And even crazier, because after this experience, I had four more in several different areas and situations. Anywho, this one took place in Lee Heighton, PA. Lee Heighton? Lee Heighton. L E H I G H T O N P A on Route 903 overlooking a valley from the giant food store parking lot. It was June 10th, 23, at 9.45 p.m. I just dropped my son off at the front door to go pick up some stuff for the un upcoming campfire. Typical father and son stuff. I drove down to the bottom of the parking lot where the grass was to where the grass was to walk my French bulldog dozer. I happened to look up and see two bright, quote, stars, end quote, in the sky. I said to myself, those stars look really bright and very odd. Maybe they're part of Elon Musk's Starlink. Then I started looking at them and realized they were a lot lower than they appeared. They were also brighter and larger and really looked out of place. I was able to grab my phone and snap one photo out of the driver's window of my truck. It was that point. The light on the right-hand side dropped down, did some crazy maneuvers, and disappeared. And as I opened the door to video and grabbed more pics, my dog rushed out and knocked the phone out of my hand. As soon as this happened, I picked up my phone and attempted to take more pictures, but realized the remaining star had gone. It had just disappeared. It wasn't there anymore. I'll send what I have, and I'm fully aware how you feel about pictures and such, but this was video in my experience, and I'll swear in a million Bibles this is exactly what happened. I have video and pictures to prove what I saw, and also use trees and buildings as scale. 
sorry so long, but I wanted to get as much details in as possible. As always, thank you for what you do, Steve. I have no idea. Sorry, you have no idea how much you help people like us. I got your sick, brother. Right on, man. I got you, too. Now, <laughs> what is up with that? Anyways, he says he's got pictures and video. I got to go in the house. I just got a text. But uh, when I come back out, I'll dig up the video. Hopefully, it's here, and we'll share it on the video. How freaking random is that? Crazy. All right, I gotta go in. I'll be right back. Oh. Here we go. Who's next? Adventure dogs in here chowing down some leftover deer bones. If you hear the noise in the background. Now, for those with eyes or the mind to see, it's the title of this email. February 8th. 2024. Good morning, Steve. I pray this email finds you well and hopefully enjoying some salmon fishing. Appreciate the kind words. I've been wanting to sit down and share a story with you and our tribe here, but now that I have the time to write, I don't know which story to tell or where to begin. I could probably monopolize a whole show by recounting strange occurrences dating back to when I was a child of the 70s and every decade since. I suppose the reason I titled this email, quote, for those with eyes or the mind to see, end quote, is so, is, is so many people are too busy living a 3D, 9 to 5 life of rushing and stress that when they do get to finally enjoy a vacation in nature, it's more about the hot sun and the beer in their hand than being in tune with their surroundings. I'm not judging them, it's just an observation, lol. I've sat with normies which don't notice a group of quail walking by or the bald eagle flying over with a snake or fish in his talons. This is shocking to me. <clears throat> I can sit in the mountains here, feel something has its eyes on me, and when I turn around, see there's a deer not eight feet away. Beautiful. Anyway, feel free to use my name. My name is Carolyn Johnson. I'm a 53-year-old wife, mother, artist, and all-around domestic goddess. LOL. As I sit here in my kitchen in the old Okanagan Valley, BC, I stare out at the mountains across the lake and I think about the so-called experts that state there is not enough land to support a breeding population of Bigfoot, Sasquatch, or Sabe. Those scientists must live in a box. Clearly, I, they clearly they are intentionally misleading the public. Yeah, they are. And here's my most recent story. A few years ago, a group of five friends and I headed west to a river rafting slash yoga retreat on the Nahatlach River, north of Boston Bar, BC, for a midweek getaway. As soon as you say Boston Bar, it's like, oh yeah, here we go. <clears throat> I knew from the stories I've heard over the years that this area is very well known for Sabe experiences. I had never been to this specific region before and did not realize how remote and stunningly beautiful this, to me, hidden away area is. The camp is tucked away in fairly thick brush and incredibly tall maple, red cedar, pine, and fir trees right next to the roaring Nahat Latch. I walk through what I consider glamping tents with attached decks also takes you down the pass past the main buildings to an area of sandy river bank in front of a huge fiddle head patch. The most fiddle heads in one area I've ever seen. With the bright sun blocked by the tree canopy, this protected little fairy-like territory really felt like a sacred area full of abundance. Right away, I felt like we were treading on someone else's territory. So much so that when I got back to our tent, while everyone else, while everyone else was sitting on the deck, furniture chatting away, I sat quietly, looked across the rushing river in front of us to the thick, thick forest, and in my head said, I know you're out here. We mean you no harm. Thank you for letting us enjoy this beautiful setting. We'll not, we will not be here long. <clears throat> Excuse me. I did not hear a reply, even though I was wondering about the mind-speak phenomenon. But later that night, there was some action. Our group of six took up two tents right next to each other. Three ladies in each. These tents are surrounded by grass on three sides, and by the deck about two to three feet off the ground on the fourth side. In my tent, 
I was in the four post single bed right next to the front side zipper up door with the other two ladies being at the back side. It was dark out and time for us to turn in. The other two gals seemed to fall asleep fairly quickly. I stayed up to read for a bit before trying to sleep as I always have trouble falling asleep without first winding down. When I did turn out my little lantern next to the bed, I barely had time to flop my pillow and roll over before I experienced a huge bang that appeared to hit the top of the tent post way above my head that instantly resonated down and into the post of my bed, which was pushed up against the tent post, making me instantly feel this reverberation in my head as it was touching the bed post. I sat up and said, what the hell was that? It, of course, woke the other two ladies, and they asked if I was okay and wondered what had happened. I said I didn't know what the sound was. It was like someone took a large tree limb and just smoked the side of the tent post with it. It sounded like wood on wood. There was no sound of anything falling onto the deck. There was no sound of anyone running away. I was listening for giggles and footsteps, thinking our friends from the next tent could be pulling a stunt, but full well knowing it was not them. We sat in the quiet, listening for I don't know how long, before the other two went back to sleep. I looked outside into the dark and, of course, could not see a thing. I really felt like some... I really felt like something just wanted to let me know it heard me. I mean, whatever hit the tent could have hit at another corner of the tent, but it seemed to know where I was sleeping, I guess. The next morning, I looked around and there was no piece of wood anywhere near the tent that could have fallen. And if it just fell, we would not have hit the post with such intent, and we would have heard a piece of wood first hitting the post and then the deck, and would have found it there in the morning. The ladies in the next tent heard nothing. We stayed for one more night, which was uneventful, but I can tell you I felt watched on my way to the outhouse in the middle of the night. I did find out that the owner and slash or management of this rafting outfit stayed in the house located in the middle of these rented out tents and his house has a fence surrounding it with outdoor lighting. There were lights here and there on the way to the outhouse, but no lights on the side of these tents facing the river where you enter them. I planned on asking staff in the main building about whether or not anyone else reported any activity that night or, or any other, but they were so busy the morning we checked out I did not get a chance to. Shit, this did turn out to be a little wordy. Sorry, Steve. If this is the, if this was the only story I had, it wouldn't have been such a big deal to me. But putting it together with so many other little incidents in Jasper, Nordegg, Hope, and Blue River over the years, in retrospect, things add up. Thank you for providing this forum for all of us. I wish you and Sarah the best. Carolyn Johnson, Summerlin, BC. All right, thanks, Carolyn. Blue River is right near where that logger went into the mountains on the west side of the highway and allegedly cut that huge hollowed out cedar down and there was a massive skeleton in it right over there and where that other guy man emailed in about his abusive drinking father when they were trout fishing on that creek and he saw that thing i think his dad saw it too same area and blue river just before blue river is where my old girlfriend had that one quote, loping beside her car, stooped over, filling the window with its face. Anyway, I remember uh, years ago, I went with a uh, rafting company from around there. We did the Thompson River, and, a, and it was a one-night camp out, too, on, the, on an island in the middle of the river. A lot of fun. Crazy country around there. Spent a lot of time running around those mountains. A lot all around there, and more, obviously. But anyway... Um, well, who knows? Maybe somebody that has been on the Nahatlach River and is watching this channel, maybe you're ready to kick loose and share what you know with us. Maybe. Or maybe not. That's all right. And there we go. <clears throat> Excuse me. I might see if maybe... What else do I got here? All right, here's a short one. I'll end with this. Clear head pick of creature east texas 
Steve, use my name, Brian C. from Texas. <laughs> That's not using your name, Brian. <laughs> just kidding, man. Not a story to share, just want to share what I believe is one of the clearest images of these entities I happened to catch in background after Cam was tripped from something hairy moving Cam. Fairly similar, similar to pics that the late Scott Carpenter shared, rest in peace. Squirrel, maybe. Maybe not move the cam. When I go down there, soon I will take a pic of myself standing where the head is at the tree. What's the deal with pics of these things with their mouth open like they're blowing smoke rings? Share or not, I know you're swamped with pics like these, but take what you will from it or not, some wise man said. All right. Ooh, that is kind of different uh, hair, isn't it? If you zoom in, there's some long, really long hairs. Oh no, sorry, I'm, I'm looking at things. That's the bark of the frickin' fir tree behind it. I'm a dumbass. All right, I can't really tell how long the hairs are. It looks like a hairy forearm. Could be a bear. Might not be, who knows. And there's the face. What do we got here? I don't know, man. Like I said before, I'm, uh, I don't see what a lot of people see, all right? I just don't. If I zoom in on that. To be fair, right? You sent it in. We shared it. I'm zooming in on it. I am quite confident that that, to me, is not the clearest face picture. <laughs> all right? I just don't see it. I'm not seeing it. I'm sorry, apologize, but that's just me. Don't jump on my bang wagon. Band wagon. A lot of people see things I don't. And that's fine. All right, that's it. Back to getting stuff done. I have to try to figure out how to get part two edited up for the ladies video, loaded up. Sarah's already making plans on how she's going to go grocery shopping for these moms of these children. That's gonna be, she's pretty jacked up. It's gonna be exciting. It feels good to do good things, right? It feels good to do to do good things. Anyway, share my story at howtohunt.com. That's where you get heard, word for word. We'll be back tomorrow.